So I want to thank everyone for inviting me, and I, 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 appreciate, I especially appreciated the ribbing the judges got from Judge Werner, but I have to tell a story about him. I was walking through court the other day, and uh, he comes up to me and he says, good one, I understand you're speaking at this uh, conference we're having, and uh, I hope that uh, it's as enjoyable and entertaining as your arguments in my court. <laughs> and of course, I'm going, I had one of these, this isn't a humor thing, Judge, I'm serious today. I had one of those Gary Coleman moments, you know, what are you talking about, Judge, you know? So I got to tell that story on him. Actually, um, any story I tell about that I actually name a person is not true. <laughs> it's just that um, Judge Rowland wasn't here today, he was called away on an emergency. But I've been asked to speak on the report for the National Association of uh, Council for Children. And um, if this was published in December of 2009 regarding its evaluation of the guardian ad litem system in Nebraska, I read through this report, it's about 200 pages of text and then a lot of attachments. And I strongly recommend it uh, for the reason that there is a great executive summary and there's some just great information, particularly for guardians ad litem to assist them in their practice. Uh, this is available on the uh, Eyes of the Child website, www.3eyes.org. And the report deals with attorneys appointed as guardian ad litems, or guardians ad litem, in abuse and neglect cases, or 3A dependency cases. Now, information concerning the evaluators and the protocol and the methodology is contained within the report, and I have a very limited time. So I'm going to deal only with the recommendations today. Uh, I'm going to have you all serve as a focus group. Um, and so I'm going to ask you some questions, and I expect you to quickly raise your hands. If it takes you as long to answer as it took for those percentages to get at the top of the screen uh, during Rose's, I can't recall whose lecture it was, we're going to be here till 6 o'clock. So I want you to promptly raise your hand. And Melissa here will help me kind of keep a tally of the percentage, because I'm interested in how we out here in western Nebraska, in God's country, greater Nebraska, answer those same questions that were asked across the state. Now, um, my handouts contain a lot of materials, the questions I'll be asking. I don't expect you to look at these while we're going through this. I truly expect you to concentrate on the questions that I ask in your answers. You're also going to find out this is going to be a kaleidoscopic uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, which is designed with my droning voice to place all guardian ad litems in a, in, in a trance, and therefore they will follow the guidelines henceforth in their practice. <laughs> Hopefully that will work. Um, I like the part two, and before I go on, I did ask my wife also to review my PowerPoint presentation, and, and I heard uh, Judge Weimer say, you know, she's so helpful and said this and that, you know. I've, I've been married longer than he's been on this planet. And my wife and I speak telephonically. I said, I, not telephonically, telepathically. And I said, you know, uh, will you look through my presentation? And it was just like one of these. And I knew immediately that really I, I could handle this on my own. <laughs> it was telepathic. <laughs> All right, from the registrants today, you can see that we have a pretty close group to what we had here. It's a little bit disappointing when you see these uh, response rates over here, but I want to point this one out right here. Here's CASA volunteers, and look at that response rate. They really deserve a round of applause for that. <laughs> there was also a focus group of 16 children that were either in or formerly in foster care, in the foster care system. And so you can see that as a total group participating there. Uh, in our review of the first recommendation, you should know that the Supreme Court did dot, adopt these guidelines for practice of guardians ad litem on July 18th of 2007. It really came out of the uh, Supreme Court Commission on Children in the Courts and the recommendations that were made there and that subcommittee. Further effective January 1 of 2008, uh, the Supreme Court Rule 4-401 regarding guardian ad litem uh, training uh, came out. And so the criticism in the first instance of the guidelines 
was that, well, these aren't mandatory rules, they're guidelines, they're practice standards, but they're not mandatory, you don't have to do it. And the criticism of Rule 4401 was that there was a loophole that allowed a county judge to, to appoint an attorney who had not received adequate training uh, if there were no other attorneys with adequate training or the, the required training available. So uh, the first short-term short goal was uh, that these powers and duties of GALs, as reflected in the guidelines or as subsequently as we sub subsequently come up with them, should be mandatory, either by statute, by Supreme Court rule, or by Supreme Court practice standard. And to me, that implies some sort of a feeling that guardians ad litem really aren't doing their job. So my first question to you that I want everybody to raise their hand as quickly as possible, how many of you feel in your practice that guardians ad litem are not doing their jobs? None? That's fantastic. See, I agree. We're sitting right, We're sitting right next to one. Uh, if you ask me, see. <laughs> Either you're embarrassed or else. maybe I should have reversed the question. How many of you think they are doing their jobs? <laughs> okay, well, I can see that there's a majority, and I do think that we're fortunate at this end of the state in that regard. Very blessed. Okay. Of the 71 guardians ad litem that responded, uh, that we rated, rated ourselves fairly highly, and that makes sense to me because of those 71 responded, obviously those are the guys that care. You know, what about the other 200 and, or 100 and plus that didn't, you know? The other stakeholders were not so sure. 58% of the 19 foster care review board members said we were not effective advocates in court. And 60% of foster care review board members said we were not effective advocates with health and, and human services. Not one foster care review board member strongly agreed with this statement. Guardian ad litems, oh, guardian ad litems, or guardians ad litem, critically evaluate health and human services case plans. And that surprises me. A majority of CASA and HHS workers said guardians ad litem do make written recommendations to the court. However, foster care Review board members, now remember now, they're the people that review the cases. They disagree. 75% of the four parents involved in the evaluation strongly disagreed that guardians ad litem make good recommendations to the court and foster care um, parents, foster parents were apparently unsure. So it brings you to the to the case that we need to break this down and see what's going on. How many of you believe that guardians ad litem sh um, investigate their child's educational needs? Yes. Investigate their child's educational needs. Raise your hand. Well, and, and I'm going to ask you generally. I, I understand that everyone knows one that does their job and one that does, but generally speaking, and all these questions the same way. How many of them investigate the educational needs? Do you still believe by a majority that yes. they do? Uh, I was surprised that the NACC report indicated the majority of guardians ad litem, uh, they said only sometimes, only sometimes, oops, pushed the wrong button. I only sometimes communicate with teachers and staff. These are our own responses, sometimes, never, a majority. I think that that uh, is a telling statistic. Um, foster care review board members and parents would disagree that guardians ad litem understand their child client's educational needs. The Supreme Court guidelines indicate that we have a duty to make an inquiry in, of any person directly involved with the juvenile who may have knowledge about the case or the development of the juvenile. And the NACC recommendations would indicate we should procure a complete file of school reports 
and stay in contact with appropriate school officials. So I, I find it incredulous that we're not doing better here. School teachers and school personnel and school records are an invaluable resource and evidence, I would think. How many of you would say that 3A guardians ad litem should remain a child's attorney in subsequent law violations? Should remain a child's attorney in subsequent law violations? Three? Four. Four? Five. Small, small percentage. In under, in, under our dual role of representing best interests and as child advocate, I think that's a fair response. Sure we can, we got the dual role. Uh, the NACC best practices standards would favor the concept of continuity of representation. So, we could do it then under that standard. And with the exception, I suppose, of contract attorneys who soon lose, uh, move to other more lucrative practice. Uh, most stakeholders would agree there is a fairly good continuity of representation in the state. But this really draws attention, doesn't it, to the efficacy of the dual role. And we we'll, may get to that later if I don't run out of time. Our guardians ad litem champions for their children's permanency. How many of you think they are? Should we make the guardian lives leave the room? <laughs> no, I don't think. How many did you get? It's too positive here. We still get a majority of you. We are champions of our child's permanence. It's one of the most critical things that we do, in my opinion. The, NAC, uh, the NACC recommendations would say that we are, and certainly no one would disagree that permanency is in a child's best interest. But. As the next three charts would indicate, here in Nebraska, we could do better. The Federal Health and Human Services Children's Bureau in its first and second rounds of compliance review of states found Nebraska is not complying in achieving permanency, and we are not consistent in promoting family visits, maintaining family connections, and evaluating relatives as potential placement resources. Um, we need to do better here, guys and particularly we guardians ad litem. An average of 22 months in foster care without permanency is too long. And the time in foster care for kids moving to adoption is even longer. I mean, when we talk about the ASPA guidelines, it's too long. We've got to do better here. And we have to be champions of that permanency as guardians ad litem. How many of you would say that GALs regularly meet with the children they represent? Regularly. What do you mean regularly? How many would you say that we adequately meet with the children we represent? I think it's about 50%. I'd say at this table. How many of you would say that we need a law that requires it? A law that requires we meet with our children? A majority. The, NAA, or the NACC evaluation indicates that Nebraska does, does uh, well in having guardians ad litem appointed fairly quickly following the filing of a 3A petition and the GALs rate themselves very highly on the timeliness and frequency and responsiveness in meeting with their child clients. And while 75% of the 16 children involved in the um, uh, focus groups could at least name their guardian ad litem by his first name, uh, they were generally not too impressed with our representation. I want to know who talked to my kid right here. He had white hair. That's all I know. <laughs> no, but seriously, this is some place that we've got. This is this is the topic of my uh, uh, my piece today. Who is my who who is my guardian ad litem? Are you my guardian ad litem? Now, 
Other stakeholders were less convinced of guardian ad litem's understanding of their child and client strengths and needs, and a majority of CASA, HHS caseworkers, and foster care review board members said guardians ad litem meet with their child clients only sometimes and sometimes never. I, I, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. This is, a, this is incredulous in light of Nebraska Juvenile Code 43 272.012D, which requires statutorily guardian ad litems to consult with juveniles within two weeks of appointment and once every six months thereafter. Further, the NACC uh, recommends in its evaluation that this be even strengthened uh, to require meetings before every temporary hearing on a quarterly basis in the child's environment and whenever there is a placement move. The Supreme Court guidelines say that meetings should be had upon request um, at every emergency or change of circumstances of the child and prior to every hearing. And a guardian ad litem should meet the child at least once at each placement location. But in rural areas, we have to travel and going to every placement uh, location at any frequency is difficult at best. A lot of our treatments, uh, placements are in Carnier. Grand Island, even beyond Grand Island, Lincoln, Omaha. So, how many of you have participated in court hearings that involve the use of Skype? Involve the use of Skype, court hearings. Very few. Uh, we are using it out here, and I think it's a great technique. And I would submit to you that it is a fantastic uh, technique in meeting with kids in these distant child placements at least once a month. I've been able to arrange Skype visits with my children in Geneva. They're very accommodating. I uh, called a child, uh, called the uh, YRTC in Kearney to set up a Skype visit. And they said, well, we can do it, but you know, we've never had a guardian ad litem ask us to do this before. And I couldn't believe that. I mean, uh, they'd only give me 15 minutes, but that's okay. All right. How many of you would say that guardian ad litem uh, are active participants in the child's team in that they meet and discuss cases with parties, the counselors, and other service providers involved in the child's case. Active participant, uh, participants in the team. I think this is one of the places that we've really improved here in the western end of the state. Um, I would say we had a super majority there mm -hmm. who would agree. Now, the NA uh, CC report, um, again, guardians ad litem uh, rated themselves fairly highly, uh, but most CASAs and HHS caseworkers would say that their contacts with guardians ad litem is simply in providing information. In other words, the guardian ad litem would request information and then they would provide it not in discussing cases with these resources in their respective roles. Uh, in this regard, we scored even less, uh, even more poorly with, uh, with by foster care review board members. And all stakeholders uh, rated uh, guardians ad litem poorly in their attendances of conferences, staffings, and team meetings. Foster Care Review Board members just do not see that we are active participants at all in the child's case. Now the second re recommendation is that guardian ad litem training should be Significantly, significantly increased or enhanced, and there should be organized on and offline opportunities for us to network. How many of you believe the Supreme Court Rule 4 401 uh, requiring guardians ad litem to have six hours of training to start and three hours a year thereafter is enough? How many of you think that is enough? Very few. Should we simply close the loophole that allows judges to appoint 
guardians ad litem without training and then require the six hours, three hours, and that would be enough? We get a little, we get a little bit uh, more approval there. A little bit. Uh, and I think that you're right, the loophole should be closed. See, one problem I have with that is, right now we've got great guardian lights. Yes. But five years ago, it was hard to find a person willing to be a guardian ad litem. And if I was limited to only the people on that list, I wouldn't be able to appoint guardian ad litem five years ago. I would have not had people to do it. Now I do. My concern is once maybe this group, five, ten years from now, decides they've got other things to do in their practice, and make them do another dry spell and not have those folks to appoint. That concerns me out here because of the limited numbers of attorneys. And I understand what you're saying, but I disagree uh, simply because uh, uh, we have done better. These guardian, guardians ad litem are getting trained, and nobody seems to have too much problem with the current statutory scheme. Uh, how many of you would say that the content of what we learn as guardians ad litem, I guess I'm addressing this just to you, is adequate? The content of what you have is adequate. Sorry, we were talking about attending an ACC conference. You, what, how many of you think that the content of what you are trained is adequate in that six hours or that three hours? Well, you're not alone. Um, only seven uh, percent. This is what I guess I'm talking about. Because we're in only seven percent uh, of the guardians that I'm responding said they had not had the training. And so I think that that shows that there's an active That's seven percent of the ones responding to the program, right? No, this is seven percent of the seventy-one responding. Right. And but then the, the rest. Respond, how many didn't respond? That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, but uh, that that's the bad news uh, that there's some out there that are responding and not trained. But a majority said it was not adequate, as as we've indicated here. I think we've had some good training today, however from some of the prior speakers. How many of you would say that guardians ad litem have access to experts? Have access? Yeah, just a little under half, I believe. Guardians ad litem could do better here. The, NAC, the NACC report would indicate that we rarely use experts and some guardians ad litem were perplexed by the question, thinking apparently that it was the responsibility of others to put on experts, the county attorney or, or someone else. Uh, the NACC recommendations indicate that guardians ad litem need to be trained to identify when an expert is needed, how to prepare them, and how to use them. But you can see at least that most of us think that we have access uh, sometimes to experts and I think we have access to experts whenever we want to look for them and use them so how many of you use listserv uh, which is that on online networking all the all the guardians I'd light them here yes sir I think it's great I use it in other areas of my practice but I'm disappointed at the response rate uh, of the juvenile law uh, section which uh, does not uh, seem to get as involved as other areas of practice, maybe that'll improve. The third recommendation is the relationship between the guardian ad litem and child needs to be changed to, uh, uh, whoops, I'm not getting through these fast enough, needs to be changed to client focused as opposed to uh, adult focused or best interest. How many of you believe we should abandon the dual role and appoint guardians ad litem in the first instance as attorney for the child's needs and desires. In other words, right now we're a dual role. We, we are best interest lawyers, which is adult focused, what's, in, what's our opinion, and then we're also advocates, attorney advocates, which is, ch uh, which is client focused. That we can, we'll do what they say if it's within the bounds of our ethics. That's our current system. How many of you think we should abandon it and be attorneys in the first instance? One. Two. 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 Thank you. Um, the NACC report re revealed that most guardians at Lyle believe that we can balance the dual role, and surprisingly, 
CASAs and HHS caseworkers would agree that we can balance the dual role. But the NACC best, best practices and national guidelines would say that guardians at litem need to be lawyers first, and in that capacity, they should comply with Section 3-501.14 of the Nebraska Rules of Professional Conduct in dealing with clients with diminished capacity. And this also involves an accountability piece, doesn't it? Because we as guardians at litem are not accountable, really, uh, because our child clients don't complain, do they? But if we were attorneys first, then others would be in a position to complain. Um, the fourth recommendation is that we should uh, establish mandatory caseload standards for guardians at litem in 3A cases. How many of you think we should do that? Mandatory caseload standards. None. Interestingly, um, a majority of guardians at litem feel that their caseloads are not too high. Uh, most would agree that if their caseload does get too high, they can bring the issue to the supervisor or to the court. How many of you believe that guardians ad litem can adequately represent their child clients with 20 hours per year per case? I was a little surprised by this too, I have to be honest, because I, as you sit there and think 20 hours per year per case, it doesn't quite seem adequate. But the NACC study indicates that the consensus in the field is that 20 hours is adequate for attorneys to devote 100% of their time to handling 3A cases. A case would be defined as one child as distinct from one family or sibling group. The fifth recommendation is that all counties using the law firm flat fee per case system with attorneys in 3A cases should phase out that system in favor of an hourly uh, basis. Available in evidence would suggest that attorneys operating on an hourly basis have more reasonable caseloads and are at and receive adequate compensation. How many of you would say that attorney GAL should be paid on an hourly basis, which is commensurate with what a county attorney receives or a public defender receives? I'm glad to see that. It's about 50%. No, a little better than 50%, 75%. Um, of the 71 GALs responding to the survey, 70% were paid by the hour, while 21% were paid under contract. None responded that they were paid flat fee per case, regardless of the number of hours spent. And 8% said they were paid by other compensation mechanisms and I don't know, I can't, I don't, I don't understand that. I guess a credit to their PayPal account. Like if a public defender just takes it as part of a deal with the county board as public defense, and it's fit into their uh, compensation. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, in any event, over 50% of the guardians at Lydon responding did not feel the compensation that they received was adequate. The sixth and uh, the sixth and last short time recommendation is that you should participate in their 3A court proceedings. How many of you agree that children over 10 years old should be present in their court proceedings unless excused by the court? I, 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 I think every hand in this room should be up for this. I have to tell you that in contrast to the guardians at Leiden's view on this subject, youth have consistently said, we want to be present in court for our hearing. And I think that they need to be. They get a greater understanding of what's going on and it just helps them overall, I believe. Um, CASA, HHS workers, foster care review board members, they, they all reported that guardians ad litem only sometimes advocate for their child clients' presence, and a majority of foster parents did not believe that guardians ad litem made certain that their child clients were in court at all. GALs need to advocate for their child clients' presence and should use Skype if there's no other alternative. 
Now, the last three recommendations of the report deal with long-term recommendations, uh, such as if we should undergo a systemic change uh, to establish an over uh, centralized state system for the oversight of guardian ad litem's uh, work. I think that we need to watch this very carefully because I think this may be a direction that some folks feel is most appropriate, particularly because it adds that accountability piece where children do not complain about their guardian ad litem or cannot. Um, Right now we're on the county-based system which does not have that centralized oversight. The eighth, eighth long-term recommendation is that we should adopt by statute a client-directed system of representation. We touched on that before. That's the abandonment of the dual role uh, and to be appointed first as a child's attorney. Um, and what evidence would suggest is that if a child's attorney is successful in chi uh, client counseling, it's going to be a rare case where there will need to be a paid guardian ad litem in addition to the attorney. So that's something I think that we will need to pay attention to. And things that I'd like you to consider as you look through the recommendations and hopefully read portions of this report. Uh, so I would like you to re review those Supreme Court guidelines uh, that I've included in your packet. Please review section 3-501.14 if we change this dual system and, and start being just attorneys first, this is what we're going to be looking at. And uh, the last recommendation is, uh, which is long term, is that we need to renovate our court facilities and make them more adequate for youth. I think that we all would agree that most court facilities are not uh, nice, child-friendly places for children to be, and perhaps we can uh, we can improve on this. I wanted to ask you if, you're, if you felt your, your particular courthouse had some child-friendly aspects to it. I really haven't seen a courthouse that does, and I think that there is going to be some, some substantial renovation necessary to have private meeting areas. Ours does have one child-friendly feature, and that's Judge Warden provides suckers at the end of the year. It's little things like that to make the difference. <laughs> well, across the board, stakeholders do agree that designated age-appropriate areas, uh, waiting areas, and age-appropriate uh, meeting areas where us and, and guardians that allow them to meet with their children are a limited commodity. But certainly, as the NACC rules would recommend, there's no reason that for very little money on a short-term basis, we can't rearrange our courtrooms so that guardians ad litem and their child clients have a place to sit that is separate and apart from the other party. This doesn't seem to be a very difficult task to me, and it's something that I think we should understand, particularly with some of the things that we've heard today about the trauma that children have. Can you imagine that trauma? when you are forced to sit next to your parent who's abused you and his, his uh, hired gun, uh, how you might feel intimidated. So I think there's some things that we can do. I'd like to just close with a public service announcement uh, from a little different perspective. Judge Gindler points out that we have had a few pops with uh, the good Judge Dorward in the past. So as you leave this place, I want you to drive carefully and take care of yourself.